says. Hey, I'm now, now recording everybody, but I think we've all been very polite. Uh, anyway, starting off informally, I don't have my cohort today. I've, this is, I've done uh, with him 67 episodes, and this is episode number uh, 71. And I can tell you the, the last three with Adam, there was so much forgotten. You know, I, had to, I don't have a poem ready. I'm not telling people to drop their name in the chat. You should, you should start doing that. All those kinds of things. Where are you from and all that. So I missed Jamal today, but he's uh, he's making money with salt mines. So that's uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, here's just the, here's the agenda and then a quick once over for uh, for first and, and maybe just second timers. Um, we're going to we're going to kick it off in a second with uh, uh, Michelle. But first, I want to ever uh, put Rex Miller on the spot. He's been listening to this anecdotal stuff and, and see what it impresses him about, you know, uh, feeling health and uh, the nudge to a healthy a workplace. And if you're not familiar with his book, uh, can somebody go to Amazon, find the link and drop it in the chat for me so I won't make him do that. So it will be Rex Miller's handler and do that book. So that's that's me on Rex Miller. But Rex, you've got some other stuff coming up and you're going to be at uh, World Workplace in Orlando uh, what's top of mind? Give me an advertisement or two, and then a reflection on um, on what you've heard in the first few minutes. Well, um, I heard a, I heard the word change management, and I heard the word data, <clears throat> and, uh, and and yes, data would be great in research around change management. It's more the narrative that is effective. Data typically never changes people's minds, but what's called the empathetic future. That's what Dr. Roizen talks about is being able to imagine the better future. Um, and the clear evidence is that doctors know that smoking kills them, but they still smoke. So um, so it's it's really getting the story. We, we like to go down into data. Uh, I like research. However, in working with, gosh, hundreds of organizations over 20 years, it's it's, it's typically the compelling reason, that, you know, the burning platform, but more importantly, the journey. How, how do we help people visualize the journey to the better future? And classic case study for that is the CBRE transformation for their world headquarters after the um, real estate crash and how they went from a broker driven culture into a team culture and change their whole space through that. So that, that's a good prototype story for change. So I only, I only got like three minutes of what you guys were talking about. So I have no idea whether that's relevant or not. That, that, that's great. And I love that CBRE example down in LA uh, also. Uh, Chris Hood and I've chatted about that a bunch because there's old people in the trip yeah. like me, seasoned hardworking brokers that, you know, they went and they just sort of put their cup of coffee in a conference room because it's 100% free address. And I'm a big fan of that. But the sales guys and gals from, you know, a different time period, it's, I, I love, you leave your laptop in a conference room and leave it open and don't do any scheduling. That's an issue. So we, I think you really need to have, which they had a lot of, you really have to, teach the old dogs new tricks to be totally. successful, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. So, yeah. That's all part of the change management is making that, that bridge. So, you know, when, when you have to change, I, I like to refer it to as coming to the end of what's working with no idea as to how to get to the other side. Uh, and so you have to build that bridge. Dr. Roizen calls it the empathetic bridge to the future. What they did with the old dogs at CBRE, they hired digital coaches for all the brokers who said, there's no way I'm going to put my 30 years of files into the cloud. Remember, there's this mysterious thing nobody understood. So they helped ease that burden um, and trivia. Chris Hood was the one that forced me to go see that job. Um, I didn't wanna see it. I've got my own perspective on how brokers operate. And I had some cognitive 
biases mm -hmm. that were, and I went with an open mind and it, it blew me away, it blew me away. Yeah, it's definitely an early step in the right direction. It hats off to that organization. They've probably been one of the uh, creative leaders in, uh, in the industry of transaction it doesn't mean they've scaled it through their organization though it just means that there's an island they have this island of innovation they experienced without a doubt and they you know they did the same thing with conference rooms uh using that uh minority report technology what do you call that who's the company in menlo park oh, I galaxy yeah and they sort of built that in chicago uh and and out here in the in Palo Alto and and played with it, but you need more people these things to to move uh, to move around. Anyway, um, thanks for that. Is, uh, besides, uh, James dropped your. Uh, I see he dropped your your book yeah. link in the chat. What do you have at World Workplace um, in October? What are you going to be talking about? I do not remember. Quite honestly, <laughs> I've got like four four or five conferences that I typically don't even look at until the week before, because it's just kind of a rolling. Most of what we've been working on is, is employee mental well-being and the burnout that's going on and the great resignation. So if, if, if you haven't read the McKinsey study, how many have read the new McKinsey study and the great attrition? Okay. You got to read that. It'll blow you away. 15 million people have quit since, from April through August, uh, five and a half million had no job lined up. And uh, so what we've been working through is this is really relational issues that surface in these pressure cooking moments. And uh, I partnered with Dr. Jernigan a year and a half ago, two years ago now, after the book Whole came out for teachers, which really dealt with uh, the burnout of caregivers. Um, that was really the issue. And trauma, that's a big issue. Before the pandemic, 4% of the wor work population had either uh, chronic depression or trauma, 4%. Now it's estimated at over 40%. So the implications we're seeing on airlines already, you know, boom, trigger. Um, before the pandemic, on average, about 150 people were banned from flights permanently. Uh, it's over 5,000 now this year and counting. How, has anybody been on a flight where some craziness happened? Okay. Okay. Marissa? Yeah. Uh, so I was flying with Lufthansa and the... When we left the, the plane, we have the police there because we're people not wearing the mask and the, the fly assistant, they were already freaking out, you know? Yeah. And yeah, sure. this is like a tiny one, but it is, it's crazy. The, 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 the nervous, the Berlin airport is like a joke. <laughs> it doesn't look like a German airport. <laughs> Let's see what happened here, really. Yeah. Well, so that's coming to the workplace. And we don't realize that. So most of our change management, to go back to that, is all logistical, tactical stuff. None of it's really dealing with people coming in that are already amped up. And so we all have this capacity to handle friction in the system, right? Somebody says something, whatever, we have no capacity. So the slightest thing can trigger somebody. Um, so part of our role, what I'm working with organizations to think about what are all the stress points in that employee journey and how do we reduce those or even better how do we improve them to engagement points uh, how do we turn our secondary spaces into primary space recovery recovery zones think through recovery differently um, in the last book um, you know I had my whole family brain scanned um, so you know, we, we take research seriously. It's kind of like method acting. We actually go do the stuff. Um, and at the Amen Clinic in LA, and there's a reason why. If you read the books, you'll see the story of my daughter who was brutally bullied in high school and traumatized. And what we know about trauma is that it, it turns somatic. In other words, that, that Vigilance, hypervigilance causes inflammation, shuts down the immune system and creates autoimmune 
diseases. So we're going to see a real spike in that. Um, we're already at a point where the, the chronic illness in the workplace is a cost burden companies can't afford, and it's rising at a 7% rate. We already know wellness programs fundamentally don't work, can't work, will never work. So we've got to really start looking at, and the pandemic now has forced our hands that we have to deal with the stress issue and the burnout issue. Um, and one of the important things to realize with burnout, it's more than just getting rest because burnout is, is, a, is a breakdown of trust. There's a moral component to burnout. Dr. Jernigan says that burnout is a thousand betrayals of purpose that go unnoticed until it's too late. So what happened, I was with a, a leader, a COO of a very large organization two nights ago, Starbucks, over two hours. He's ready to walk out the door. And, um, and it's because of the president and he uh, had a, a, a disagreement and because of stress, it just wasn't no, nobody ever closed the loop or broke it up. And he thought, gosh, I've been here 10 years and that's the relationship I've got. Not even being able to put himself in the other person's shoes as to why, why he responded that way. So a lot of what we're doing is simple marriage counseling, you know, helping people understand that these things you're reacting to and feeling are, are stress-driven and relational. And, and so how do we repair that? And that's coming back to the workplace. So, you know, we've got things like change architecture. How many are familiar with change architecture or nudges? Okay, get familiar with them because part of the challenge is we've got to start shifting population behavior or population health. And what we know is the most effective way to do that is use public health design strategies, which are, it's behavioral economics, but it's called nudges. Uh, the other thing we can do is reduce the, the friction points, you know, audit all the touch points, which ones are friction points and neutral, and begin working on them. That's the GoDaddy story in the book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge. The other thing GoDaddy did is they turned their facility support people into what they call experience managers. And they gave them four seasons hospitality training, you know, on on how to have emotional intelligence in doing your job. So at 10 feet, I give you eye contact. At five feet, I give you voice recognition. Hi, Nina, how are you? And, but all the time I'm reading and if Nina looks stressed, then I know, Nina, it looks like you're having a challenging day. Anything I can do to help you? And she, Nina will say, well, I'm late for a meeting and I've got to get this stuff copied. So my job as a facility person is to say, Nina, can I take your stuff to copy? I'll get it copied and leave it on your desk. That's a stress reducer, right? And you feel great. Uh, and then Dr. Mike O'Neill's work on legible design, making things intuitive, recognizing that every space has a voice and it's telling, if it's clear, it tells you what we do here, uh, who's important and permission, what, what we have permission. So I threw a lot out, but that's the work we're doing. Yep, that is just fantastic content, a lot coming up. And I know you're going to be talking about that during the WE track of... Uh, is that what I'm talking about during WE? Yeah, it is. You, you hit it right on the head. I was surprised. You said, I don't know anything. And then you said what, in fact, we know to be true. So thank you for executing. For first timers here to the mosh pit, we do these sort of things. And, and what a great warm up act Rex Miller is. Uh, for Michelle. Before we introduce Michelle, I want to put Diane Levine on the spot, ask her to unmike and just quickly give us a 22 second vignette on the best new book that is about to be written. And it, I hope it's going to be current work on the move three. Four. Is it four? No, three. 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 Okay. <laughs> he's yeah, wrong that really... time. Otherwise, he's right. Yeah. The okay. book is going to be launched at IFMA's World Workplace Conference uh, October 25th. And it, uh, I see one author in the audience here, Lisa. Um, there are 19 authors from around the world in the book. And uh, 
The co-editors are Michael Schlein, founder, a co a founder of FM Systems, as well as Alexi Marmot, professor at UC College London. Um, it's, it is a new book and it is featuring new items and uh, you can go to our website. I'll put the link up in just a few minutes to uh, pull down, uh, download a teaser chapter called The New Hybrid Workplace. But the book talks about global workplace trends, the future of real estate, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability, and planetary health, uh, trends in facility services, and also health and well being in the workplace, and a lot of the topics that you've been talking about today. That's one book. We also have another book we just published in May. Uh, we, it was an actual update of a book. Um, it's called Applying What Scientists Know About Where and How People Work Best. And this was uh, uh, written by Dr. Sally Augustine. It is a fabulous book if you're a workplace strategist or uh, you know, head of facilities or real estate. Um, it is a bibliography of evidence-based design research in the workplace. And the book, what Sally does is she takes the research and just synthesizes it into one paragraph. And then we included all of the links so that you can link to the actual peer-reviewed research. Um, and the research is all about implications of sensory experience in the workplace, worker experience and basic architectural forms, psychosocial factors affecting worker performance, workplace design and workplace behavior, uh, the effects of workplace design on human behavior as well. So it's, uh, it's a fabulous um, bibliography that when I was in workplace strategy, I used just about every day it was my Bible. So very excited and thank you, Lisa, for being one of the authors in the book and, uh, and for sponsoring as well. Colliers was a sponsor, uh, FM Systems Plan on ABM Services, I see Rafi uh, in the audience, he was one of the sponsors of the publication as well. Fantastic, I appreciate that. If, if everybody else could mute themselves, if you're not muted uh, already, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Osman, uh, PhD, critical care nurse, interior designer. She denies not, she says no, not a, uh, an architect, but I don't believe that. And uh, she's been at this intersection at this wheelhouse for 18 months of bringing those, those spatial social things uh, and, and the concerns that come with them. And website is something, web, W-E-B, hyphen side is how I write it, um, is something that in the medical profession has been around for a while. When you, if you have someone on the phone or uh, on a video call and you're, and you're trying to get to the core of, uh, of their physical and mental health, you're, you need to build empathy in a virtual environment. So doesn't it seem right that website, based on a lot of the principles we just heard from Rex Miller, would be something that we could port over to the corporate workplace environment. With that question, I'd like you all to welcome with a quiet clap. So funny. Michelle Osman. David, you're always so fun. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me uh, here today. Um, when, when David mentioned this to me and I, you know, what could we discuss? It seemed that the idea of website, and it comes from a bedside manner, is, is really where it comes from. This idea that the whole point of the interaction with the patient is to gain trust, is to express empathy, and to have that relationship. Um, but what does that look like when it happens virtually? And um, I'm going to have just 10 slides. They're super fast just to set the stage. And then I would love to have a debate and conversation um, with you all about this. That sounds OK. And so let me share my screen. And then I'm going to. All right, are we good? You see the one screen? Awesome. All right, so when um, when I talk about uh, when I talk about website manner, it really is again about um, the virtual, the computer mediated. We're not talking really here in this case about phone or, or just audio, but really that video connection. Just so we can clarify some terms here. So uh, I, I love this line. This is um, from a, a piece out of the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. Um, talking about the training that they're doing at Weill Cornell, because there's this recognition 
that uh, what we learn to do uh, at the bedside is certainly not the same when we need to uh, have a, a therapeutic communication event with a patient. And I would argue with a colleague, right? So we teach business communication skills. Right? We learn from watching others. We learn from engaging over time, uh, how to read a room, how to be read. Uh, and there's that question, you know, am I, am I effectively communicating? And as we all know in communication science, right, it's all in the eyes of the receiver, not the sender. Um, and, and moreover than that, we know that people are missing that communication and that connection piece uh, and, and the burnout that you just spoke about. You may or may not know that uh, what is seen to be the antidote, if you will, or the prevention point to burnout in clinical communities is connection with your patient. That seems to be the, the piece that keeps people robust um, to experiencing burnout. And yet we are now placed in, in, in a setting where that communication event, that connection, that empathy could in fact um, be limited. So my question really is for us, how can we design for website manner or for us in business for a therapeutic communication or a connection communication? So many of you probably know that uh, most of our communication is in fact uh, based on our bodies, right? And, and while I'm gonna argue here that bedside manner is at risk when it's virtually mediated, right? I'm trying to make a connection with you, have you trust me via this, uh, this interface here, um, we know that it's going to be affected uh, and will affect your effectiveness as a business communicator. So the whole notion is, um, can we in fact uh, still express these things like uh, body language, which is the majority piece of that communication event, um, even though we're speaking virtually, right? We have this computer screen that is going to be in the way. And we ask this question for ourselves on the clinical side is what quality is really essential to delivering that value that, um, that our patients want, that our colleagues and that our clients want. And we know from the communication side that those key pieces are trust, empathy, and social presence. So given that much is nonverbal, which is to say that it's visually sensed or it's visually appreciated, that setup for the nonverbal is going to be really important. Um, so social presence, I want to define that a little bit for y'all. Um, social presence or co-presence is that sense that I'm with another person, right, that we're together. Um, and it's really dependent upon the ease in which a person feels like they have access to the other person. And this was introduced about um, 30 years ago, 30, 30 or so years ago um, by Short and colleagues. And there's a whole body of work on social presence and the effect of media-rich environments if you want to dive into that, I would suggest uh, taking a look at that literature and I can point you in the direction of some pieces. It, it's really rather robust. Um, but fortunately, um, you know, the, in the medical community, we've been pretty clear about uh, what it is we can do to start to create that virtual communication event and to have it be therapeutic. And so we know that bringing the screen, right, bringing this sort of mediator in play does a couple things. Um, it reduces those nonverbal cues, right? Micro expressions, hand gestures, these, these all convey meaningful information, but they're often lost in these virtual encounters. Um, mutual gaze, which is when the, my gaze happens to fall within the cone of gaze of, of another person, um, and that's the whole notion of being looked at, is limited uh, virtually. Like, does it look like I'm looking at you, even in this moment? Um, that's, that's that challenging piece there. Um, the second is sharing control. And, and this may or may not be something that we want to do on the business side, depending, of course, on uh, what our goal is. Um, all of us know the, the sort of um, the benefit of the home court, if you will, right? Bringing someone into your office. That's reduced uh, when you're virtual. There's that whole notion of a shared control and a shared reality, which if you're trying to create a, a collaborative relationship with someone, one can see how the neutrality of, of, a, of, a, of a virtual encounter can actually be um, very positive. So that power is, is diminished, which again is something that we definitely want when we're trying to build a relationship. Um, the next is affecting the individual impression. So personal spaces um, can have the sort of, uh, can have psychological significance because they do reflect someone's personality. Um, and they provide cues about my level of openness and agreeableness. We certainly don't think about that necessarily. There is this idea that a home environment might reduce a patient's distress. I, I don't know that we've looked at that so much on, on, the, on the workplace side. I, I would love to hear if some of you all are familiar with that, um, with that notion. But there is this idea that patients, in some cases, do prefer to see that professional or a technical background. And I would argue that's probably also a bit cultural. Um, next is it distorts the, the spatial distance cues. Um, video communication alters that because it takes our view of a three-dimensional space and makes it flat. 
into this 2D image. So the video camera can alter the, the perception of my face. Like if I get too close to the camera, um, I might appear you know, discomforting. It feels like I'm invading your space. Certainly may not wish to do that depending on the relationship you have with someone. Um, and objects like desks, uh, depending on how you've arranged your camera, can seem as if they're in between and we're in this sort of adversarial position as opposed to being collaborative. So these spatial distance cues can be significant as well. And the last is ambient features. We're all familiar with this one. Do you have proper light and the you know, blue wall that we were all heard about and controlling for noise? Uh, essential simply because uh, light affects what we can decipher on a screen. Clothing choices, I'm not gonna go into that. We, we all know about that one. So um, fortunately, um, the authors out of telemedicine and e-health came, came up with some pretty, pretty easy ways to think about how it is we can set ourselves up for a positive therapeutic communication or a close communication encounter. Um, the first is this notion of immediacy and closeness of individuals. You certainly wish to have part of that. And it, it's defined by my body orientation. Am I leaning forward? Am I making eye contact with you? And part of it has to do with if, and I, I can't see how what I look like right now, but if my face is like this, you probably can't tell if I'm leaning in or out. And if I do, it might get super odd because of the distortion we just talked about. If, however, I'm leaning back and you, um, or I'm back far enough into the screen that you can see the upper third of my body, this allows you to make sense of me leaning forward or engaging with you or taking a, a step back or expressing or thinking off in, in, into the distance. These different pieces um, are, are important um, for those nonverbal cues. The next is relaxation. The sort of notion of arm symmetry, my angle, and my leaning. I mean, even if I do this, I might appear more relaxed than I would if, again, I was super up close. And that last part is the, is the responsiveness, how active my face is in, in, in our discussion. The next is improving proximity, excuse me, improving proximity cues. Um, there's that perceived audiovisual information that is changed depending on the size of the room. I don't know if you know, but apparently when we wear headphones, um, the sound, uh, the, the timing of the sound is that much faster that it can make that information go much, much faster. And depending on the person that you're speaking with or the complexity of the information, that can be challenging. So even think, thinking, th thinking about things like that and the clutter that you have in your space um, can make a, a, a significant difference in terms of those cues. I, I don't know if, if you know, but humans are not able to perceive distance or perceive depth in and of itself we're only able, able to perceive the distance or the depth of objects, and those give us a cue around the space. So again, thinking about what you have in your background is important. Um, the individual impression. Now, this is certainly cultural and situational. Um, uh, there's someone on the mosh pit who frequently uh, shows up with these wonderful Hawaiian print shirts, and I always enjoy those quite a bit. But um, certainly it, it is uh, important uh, culturally and situationally. Um, I have a, a story, my boss was on the phone with a client one time who asked him to stand up to see if he was wearing proper pants for the meeting. And so, you know, it's interesting how, uh, how the clothes we wear, the backgrounds we choose can suggest that notion of professionalism. Of course, we're all familiar with that. I, I will say in terms of the simulated backgrounds, there is some burgeoning evidence that clients or patients may prefer a real than a simulated background. Um, I think it's still um, out there to, to know if that is the case uh, on the corporate side, but that does seem to be starting to be um, an issue, at least for, for a patient um, encounter. And the last thing, of course, about this is that um, having a video encounter with someone in their home and being able to see their space offers a glimpse into their lives. And you know, in, in, in a time of COVID, especially when we are remote, and for many of us, we, we may never go into the office, especially if we start having folks come in uh, and join our companies who live across the country and, and may rarely come into the office. How does that start to, to create the sense of, I know you and you know me, because we know a little bit more about each other's lives. Right? Um, augmenting that ambience uh, is of course, uh, something we're all familiar with by now. That occasional dog bark, which you could argue certainly does uh, bring that sense of, of personality and knowing self. I won't go into this one any further because I know we know this one. And so I'm going to close with this question that uh, 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 was written up in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, where a patient asked at the start of a telephone call, are you wearing your white coat? Right, Because there was this sense of that is how I expect to see you. Um, this is how I know you. This is how I encounter you. Now, white coat, syn white coat syndrome aside, um, the idea that there are those cues, those physical social cues that help us feel like we know what we're about, um, we know what to expect, um, and we have connection with others is something that is lost 
um, in this computer mediated environment. And so uh, optimizing those things that we know that make a difference can certainly only help enhance um, our relationship and communication with others as we try to develop relationship, um, especially given rates of burnout in this country. So that's it. And um, I would love to, uh, how do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. Oh, no, not that. Stop share. Here we go. Dynamite. Yeah, agree. Agree. <laughs> Golf clap, everyone. That's wonderful. Super fast. Yeah, you know, a lot, as always, when you, you talk, thanks for stepping on the mosh pit yet again. A, a lot of great content, succinctly put. And, uh, and, and I'm going to emphasize the word great because it always gets me to sort of think outside of my uh, my narrow optics. And the first thought I had just to throw out, and then as people are getting warmed up, how the mosh pit works is, yeah, you could either, if you raise your digital hand, then you're definitely in the queue and you won't be uh, uh, cut off. And how you raise your digital can is you go to reactions, you click on that icon that says reactions. As you all know, I'm just telling you what you know, and then you click on the raise hand and don't worry about it. It kind of puts you in the order of the queue. What hit me uh, is the idea that this is digital inequity. Some people, as Jennifer Scott, director of Coca-Cola Americas was saying last week, we have people in South America that have the equivalent of a very large family in 500 US square feet. And there's a lot going on that they're trying to manage and being distracted by, as well as the identities portrayed. How do we, how do we even begin to address the, the, the economics uh, associated with that? Meaning that's reality, that's how that person uh, lives and the, the staying power they have in the office talking about a marketing plan that's being implemented is going to be perceived differently when they have an unequitable digital situation. Wow. No doubt. I mean, and I'm sure lots of others have examples of this. We're struggling with this on the patient side too, right? Because I, I started this out by saying, well, this is a video communication conversation. But we know many of our patients don't have access to bandwidth and data. And if we just, you know, lay the foundation that 55 and I need to establish trust with you, my patient, in five minutes, right? How do I do that if you can't see my expression? You can't see how I'm leaning forward and paying attention to you. Now, this you, you could argue this is some of the benefits of, of, of the legislate of the legislation that was trying to suggest that before you could do a video visit or a phone visit, you had to have met that person in person first. Right? That used to be the requirement. That's been shifted a bit now. Right? But it, it calls into, into question um, how do we provide equity uh, when it's data, when it's distraction, when it's what have you. You know, I, uh, uh, Rex, take us in any direction. I see you're unmuted. Oh, my big question here too is, are, are you tracking kind of the, the load, the, the additional cognitive load, the brain power it takes to do all this filling in the blank? Uh, you know, the brain is the largest calorie consuming organ. What's that doing to us, especially people that are 10 hours a day doing this kind of thing? Oh, certainly. And I think that's the exhaustion that clinicians are experiencing um, mm -hmm. when they have to be on all the time. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone has done any studies seeing if it is more cognitively burdensome to be on a video call versus being in an emergency department with bells and whistles and things going off on you all day long. You could probably make a reasonable case that it's not that dissimilar, uh, but yeah. certainly not the case um, for folks in a, in a typical office setting. Yeah, interesting. Definitely. Anybody else? How does this touch you? The whole idea of uh, building trust. You know, we've talked a lot about this. David Slight. But just quickly, two things that struck me. One, a bunch of those things appear to be set up rather than in the moment, right? So, but, you know, like, so everybody could do that. But then also, because it, it kind of happened to me, the other thing, and, and I've heard, I've heard anecdotally about this on the receiver end, I can choose how you appear on my screen. Mm -hmm. I'm in gallery view here while you were doing the presentation. I put you in side by side with the slides. So, you know, there, there's all I, you can try to do all this stuff, but I can control it 
And there, there is a kind of a, I want to be in control of what I receive rather than being manipulated by you. Because mm -hmm. how does that work with doctors and things? It's so interesting you say that because I debated sharing you with something that is called the ready model of communication. It comes out of the Cleveland Clinic. And um, there's this whole setup in the beginning of that conversation. And what they've done is there's a great piece that maps the ready model of communication onto a virtual visit and what that would look like. And the key part of the beginning of the visit would be to set it up with the patient. In other words, take them through, this is how you can change your screen so that it works best for that patient. So there is that moment. Now, I didn't talk about that here because I figured we were all business professionals who spend our days on Zoom and for heaven's sakes, know how to change it as is best for us. But certainly if you have a novice or someone who just isn't familiar with Zoom as opposed to you know, Teams, which I have to use most of the time, that can be helpful. So there, that is part of the model for, um, for medicine. I, I like to be nice to people and assume they do know how to turn their computer on, but the data says they don't, I'm afraid, right? Fair enough. Hey, uh, uh, Donna, you're up next. What a fantastic day it is now that I see your smiling face all the way from Canada. It, at 7 a.m. on Tuesday, are you gonna, are we gonna restart what we've been missing for five weeks? Can you get those people, you know? In... I'm working on it. I'm okay. working on it. They've gone, okay. they've gone AWOL on me and they're very busy. And actually I know that Chris next week is riding his bike across Ireland for some very good cause. And so um, I, all I can guess is that it's still been put off a little bit, but Tuesday mornings are like, I have changed for me. I'm missing that experience in Clubhouse where we get a chance to continue all these conversations. You'll be the first to know. As soon as I know anything, I'll at least uh, send you off an email. Great, and, and we'll, share it. we'll share it because Chris yeah. Kane, who she's referencing is uh, Kane. DG's uh, former boss. So David George knows a thing or two about the wonderful work they did together uh, for the BBC. In, uh, and we're going to talk about that uh, yet again later today. Later today. I'm sorry, Donna. What did you have as a question or comment? Yeah, no, I really want to speak more to what you're discussing here right now, because this is so important and so valuable. And thank you, uh, Michelle and Rex and others that have spoken at this point. Um, I think we're all acknowledging that the virtual experience, while it can do many things, it does not take the place of in-person. And we know that. And yet we've also had people report that there's experiences that they've had virtually that have been very rich. And in some cases, even more profound than some of the in-person stuff, because we can't assume that some of the good communication that we know is so needed in person happens either, because often it doesn't. And so we've had lots of those conversations here as well. Um, the thing I was going to build on, and I may have missed a little of what you've talked about is, and I think you have referenced it, is the opportunity that we have to frame the communication, the conversation before we just launch in. We have this amazing opportunity to kind of set some context and make explicit things that otherwise might be assumed. And I think that builds on very much on what you've been saying, Michelle. Um, and so rather than assume, if, if that some of the what you've just described can be declared, you know, we all know we can't quite see the nonverbals in the same way and we can't kind of pick up on some stuff. So things that would make it easier for people to own where they are, to feel invited to speak. Um, those those moments at the beginning of a meeting and checkpoints through a meeting, depending on the nature of it. And then again, at the end, in terms of how do we do, what can we do to make this better? Because we know at times this isn't perfect. And some people tend to speak up more and some less and all of that. So I see what you've just described as an amazing, you know, a really good springboard for that conversation. And I think we all agree that the richness of life ought to include all of it. It's not either or, it's not saying, okay, now let's just go to this virtual world for everything and everybody get with the program and don't, and if you don't like it, you should. And we do have those 
differences in technology capability. I mean, I'm a case in point. I have high speed rural internet at home. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> and, and here I am at the office right now. There's times where I really need to get in here just to get clear. In, uh, clear internet. So this is really good stuff. It's a continuation of other conversations we've been having like this that speaks to the human side of things. And what we've been referencing is like, bring on age of human. The industrial age wasn't perfect. There were a lot of things that were not really good about that, very mechanistic that didn't make space for us all anyway. So let's, uh, let's approach this next chapter that we're in and there'll be more technology and improvements in technology, hopefully not driving technology. Let's approach this from the standpoint of what can we do to be more human? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what we all need. We want to be heard. We want to feel like we matter. We want to feel like somebody cares about us and our life, not just the boxed in part of us that shows up at whatever work in whatever form we, we show up in, but we're whole people. And we always have been all along, but you know, kind of now is the time where I think there's more of a recognition that people are no longer willing to the same degree mm -hmm. to just be boxed into some narrow version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I want to say in the moment. And I'm at happy hour at Fractal and they just <laughs> put me a glass of wine and I'm probably waxing pontific because he gave me a glass of wine so we can blame him. Thanks. No, you were, Donna, you were wonderful. Right. And that whole human centric approach that you are well known for and execute on is what we have next week as well when the HR crowd comes to town. But we'll say more about that when Danielle is up because she knows HR better than I do. Marissa, all the way from Berlin, Germany, my favorite Venezuelan with uh, a, a Italian DNA. What is going on? How are you? No, thank you, Michelle. It was wonderful because I'm, I, I, I see us the way you see. Also with the Zoom background, I, the real background talks about you. I just have a question because um, what you, you talk about the move, the body movement and the inclination, we, we call that in Spanish, acompasar. And you do that with a lot of psychologists and PNL. But for me, one key point is the smell. You were talking about the sense, the acoustic sense, the see the lighting and everything. But for people related in the medical part, for me, smell is still a, a key point to trust. How you deal with that in the virtual? No, really, because go direct to the reptile brain. And the other question I have is, I'm quite worried and freaking out with the metaverse right now, <laughs> you know? And how, do you have any, any uh, input or info about what is coming because I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to get too stressed about it, but I'm trying to build a different perspective because Metaverse is coming and it's a virtual world. How, how, how will it affect us if you have so many, any data on that? And thank you so much. It was great. I, I don't have data on that. My apologies. Only what I've read, which is I'm sure very similar to what the rest of you have read. Um, you know, there, again, there is this idea about, um, the only comment I will say is that um, mental health being a good example of where we don't have enough providers and we have so many people who need that sort of care. Um, and the whole idea that if I can form a relationship with you such that the technology fades away and I don't notice it, that is when we've succeeded, right? So insofar as a metaverse allows us to get what we need when we need it, however we need it, wherever we need it, um, to the benefit of our health, to the benefit of our being human, then I can only think that that would be a positive. Um, and forgive me, I forgot your first question. Oh, the smell. Yes, um, you know, we, we uh, that's lost, right? It's 100% lost, you, you, you know, at, at least right now. I, I can't imagine what that would look like technologically, but, you know, we certainly don't have it. I will say that um, there is a great deal of training on how to be able to conduct a physical exam, uh, even if you're not there and done reasonably well. And the, the key reason why is this, you should, you should all know that uh, the medical legal burden is the same, whether you are in person or virtual. Like you don't get to say, oh, well, you know, I, I saw that person over the phone or over video. So, you know, I don't really know that I got the diagnosis correct. That's not acceptable. So uh, doctors are very keen on, if I don't feel like I can do the proper exam, we can we convert to a, a, a physical, um, an in-person sort of scenario so that you know that. So um, to your point that uh, if that would be a key determinant, 
you would come in, right? So. It, it, very good. And I said that human centric is what it's all about. Danielle, you really helped us in the past when you led a talk a couple of months ago and we cut down a one minute section of it. It's a 17 minute and one minute. And the one minute that you open up saying, you know, the millennials have just turned 40. Uh, that has almost 900 views on our, our YouTube. So you're very, very popular, Danielle, oh, wow. helping us out in the past. And uh, how you doing? What's your comment? Good, good, good. So I guess two, two comments. So I think um, your talk really helped me realize the, um, the angst maybe, and maybe this is different, that employers are feeling for having remote workers. So from one hand, you know, they're doing all the work the same amount of work that they're that they're doing in the office, but then there's this whole pull um, for empl employees to come back to the office, and I'm wondering if, if that's related to the same sort of issues of of having in person in person healthcare and, and that importance. Is it is it all those things, or is it more selfish? Is it is it more uh, selfish in term uh, the employer side, where they're like, oh. You know, are they really saying, oh, it's better for trust, it's better for spatial, whatever, like we're having all these side, um, all these health risks of, of people working remote all the time. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing. And then the other question is more of a question in terms of the technology is, you know, we already have um, the Nintendo Wii Glove and all these things that like allow us to, you know, really try to um, communicate and interact virtually. I'm wondering what you're starting to see in the medical profession for those those sort of tools. They're certainly burgeoning, right? Um, more and more, we're, we're uh, trying to create a connection and, and use technology where we can. Again, yeah. however, the people that really need that the most are the ones that don't have it. Yeah. Right? I mean, quite frankly, I'm not worried about you and me. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna self advocate. It's yeah. for the rest of the folks that just aren't. And actually there's a fascinating paper, I need to find it again, um, talking about the whole notion of even um, uh, virtual or using chatbots as uh, therapy, as I'm sure many of us are familiar, the whole notion that it's just as good and the whole psychological community coming out in, in deep concern about that. And of course they, they want the help, no doubt. I don't think it's an issue of job security. They can get a job anywhere they want. But that um, to be able to use a, a chatbot, you have to have a lot of self-efficacy, right? You have to have a lot of, and there's that therapeutic that's alliance. Right. Yeah, that's right. There's a therapeutic alliance that happens with another human. And that th there's this notion that that is the core component towards success. Mm. And how do we get that with a computer? Um, so m much, much more research that needs to be done on that to get that right. Cool. But thanks for your question. Very cool. Hey, uh, Nicholas Domingo, is this your second mosh pit? I mean, or, you know, it, it, yeah, I mean, you're still kind of a, a neophyte, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation with a lot of um, pieces that contextualize for like how things need to be conducted and where to place things. I thought that was really impactful. I, the question I have is around um, trauma and how these like new forms of trauma that are going to be coming from basically what you're talking about this 2d interaction being a kind of a consistent part of our day um, with that like evolution into new sets and new kind of causes of trauma are there any or is there any research about new forms of resilience training or or different tools that people can enact on a daily basis in relation to these new traumas or is it kind of uh, just kind of the typical ways that you can address it. Uh, that's fascinating. I haven't, um, I haven't uh, read of anything in terms of Zoom and or the sort of digital interaction being uh, associated with trauma. Um, but what I have seen, which is interesting, is the idea that, uh, and it has to do with the, the original burnout literature, where we used to look at the individual and say, well, you need to heal yourself first. Mm -hmm. And instead recognizing that far more of what will affect whether or not you're burned out has to do with extrinsic factors, right? Not things that, that I can control, but how the organization, all the sort of setup that makes it happen to me, right? So um, in, terms of, in terms of trauma, how can we manipulate those variables? And instead of just training me to be more responsive in that situation, 
let us instead pick that, fix that situation. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't engage in that sort of activity. I mean, I can only control myself to be sure, but um, as leaders of organizations, what is our responsibility to others? Um, I think it was, you know, Donna who talked about, um, you know, making a connection with, uh, you know, a, as a human and making sure that we think about uh, how that works with others. And uh, it occurs to me that, I mean, how many of you have had classes on communication? Like where you've been, people have watched you engage in an interaction with others and like rated you. So we only have it. We have a couple. It's super common in uh, in nursing schools, right? So I'm a nurse practitioner. I can't tell you how many classes I have had on how it is I can immediately develop trust uh, with a patient. And I'll tell you, my first patient I ever had was a former uh, psych nurse in a psych ward. Like I was in a psychiatry ward, and she was a psychiatry nurse who was now having issues. And I was terrified. And I'm sitting there, and she informed me that my body language was not therapeutic. I mean, I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. It was, it was, yeah, it was amazing. But, um, you know, how often are, are we taught that? And in turn, how to um, prevent trauma with others. Um, when I think about my team and how to communicate, I care. Mm. I've only met some of them once because of the pandemic for like an hour. And we've been together as a team for over two years, right? So to, to the points that I think that have already been made, and this is why this really becomes an HR question, um, far more than a technology question, far more than a built environment question, but thinking about the human first and then environment and technology as tools, as factors that affect the human, right? It needs to come from that side. I think we all agree. Good. Well done. Uh, between uh, Lisa and Rex, I don't know who's next because it, my computer flipped, but it's going to be Lisa because I heard put the human first and you're the person on July 2nd, I believe you've infamously said, we've tried that before, putting the human first. It doesn't work. Put Ooh, the planet first. So people. interesting. <laughs> well, that, that, yes, David, I did say that. But what I'm, what I'm going to uh, mention, what really hit me, Michelle, when you just said that uh, as a professional, you can't use as an excuse that you see somebody on a screen versus in person that you, they have really got to work hard to make sure that they're getting a diagnosis. And I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I just okay. thought, all right, mm -hmm. wow, wouldn't that be awesome if our people managers were trained how important this interaction is and how they need to go the extra mile to make sure, uh, as a client says, the thing is the thing, you know, what's really going on with them and how can they go a little deeper and try harder? I think we learned that it was lacking in person. This, this empathy, this real relationship building was lacking in person. And there's certainly room for improvement now in the virtual world. So I just, I really loved that. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. It's awesome. Thanks for your time. I love it. Hey, uh, Rex, what's up? Hey, uh, this is a lot of fun and so many things have gotten triggered. Uh, one is the metaverse conversation. So I've got three kids under 30. Um, and one of them, my daughter is on the spectrum and I know she does better in a mediated environment because it doesn't overstimulate her and she's got some space. And we know that about 40% of people have some kind of learning uh, you know, some kind of what, what you might call a need, you know, whether it's ADD, OCD, anxiety, all of that. So mediated environments are a little bit of a filter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the jury's going to be out. It's kind of, you know, remember at one time we didn't have anything called print. And then these books came and it destroyed oral culture and community. In fact, Victor Hugo writes in uh, Phantom of the, uh, not Phantom of the Opera, but um, uh, Notre Dame. What's what's the book? Victor Hugo's book on- uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he talks about how the book, how the print destroyed the priesthood and destroyed crafts. So this new medium we're going into, there's going to be trade-offs, but I think some people are going to benefit, some people are going to hate it, and it's a whole new language for us to learn. So yeah. it, it, it's really stimulating. One, one of the interesting questions that I've got for Michelle is that, you know, for at least for general practitioners, 
the statistics show that, or research shows that about 70% of people who go to a general practitioner is basically stress. They're going there. It, it's not a, not a, you know, there's not a somatic issue. It's a stress-based issue that they go for. How is this environment going to either improve or, or make that a bigger challenge? I mean, to your point, right? Um, you know, there's the whole, there's the joke that uh, gastroenter gastroenterologists are actually um, psychotherapists because so much that's wrong with our bellies, uh, or shall I say, yeah. so much wrong with stress is manifested in, in our bellies. And so, you know, that's certainly um, uh, a question. I will say I have, and I don't know that there's actually been any official studies on this because it's only been, um, you know, over the past year where telemedicine right. went from a, right. like 0.5 to 40% and now back to around 20% or so. But uh, there's this notion of uh, the revelatory value of the home visit and how that is starting to happen uh, oh. this way too. Yeah, yeah. Because patients feel more comfortable. As I said before, the whole power dynamic, I'm in my space, I'm not in yours. And that doctors are reporting that they're finding their patients reveal far more about themselves and are far more open. Fascinating. Yeah. When they're on their own homes. And so again, I, I think the jury is still out whether that's reported wi you know, widely, but anecdotally, I keep hearing this over and over again. Mm about patients revealing self far more in their own homes um, than they do when they come in. Wow. David, can, can I throw out one thing on resilience Please. for people? Read the book Flourish by Martin Seligman. And we've taken that research that he did with the military and added a sixth component to resilience. Real quickly, there's six elements. It's, it should be core training in every company. The first one is resilient mindset, and that consists of grit and positive emotion. The second element is playing to your strengths. Clifton strengths is a good start. The third is your circle of five, the relationships that are vital to you. The fourth one is energy, which is sleep, eat, move. The fifth is purpose and meaning. And the fifth is having a sense of making progress on a daily ba basis. So, and we actually do have training on that. We just took the International Well Building Institute through a five series workshop with uh, Dr. Jernigan on that. Fascinating. Awesome. And it, uh, no, Michelle, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to close, uh, you know, Rex, to follow up on, on your point on, on neurodiversity. There is, um, again, more literature uh, in, um, in clinical medicine, the idea that um, this mediated environment, to your point, can be beneficial, especially for patients for whom being in person is far more stressful. And given that we want to bring people of all types into our work environments, you know, it may, you may in fact be far better off with someone who can choose to turn off the video or to knit while they're listening. I, I for example, I listen much better when I'm knitting. I don't know that I can bring my knitting into the office. You know, I mean, I don't know. It's an, like, it's an interesting question. Like I can do this in my house because no one can see my hands. I don't know if that actually works if I'm in a workplace. So things like that um, uh, are, are, are still sort of open, uh, open questions, I think for all of us. Fantastic. Before we go to Marissa, uh, I'll, I'm channeling the spirit of Jamal he has an inner journey that keeps the trains running on time. If, if you've got a top of the hour, you don't even have to say goodbye. And you could say something in the chat. Uh, you could send me an email saying how much you love this and it's very purposeful. But I would never guilt you into doing either. Just disappear at top of the hour. Then we'll stop the recording shortly thereafter. And, uh, and anyone who wants to hang around till the bottom half of the hour, you're, you're welcome to. It sometimes is... Sometimes it's 20. That's a lot of fun. And a quick shout out to my father. Uh, Dad, did you hear that? You had a GI at Stanford for 30 years training everybody. And I never thought of you as a psychiatrist. I'm going to rethink how you are awesome. Ask him. I'd be curious to see what he says. Yeah, we'll see what Gary Gray of uh, Stanford he says. Google him. He's, uh, he's quite a character. Marissa, it... Uh, I, I have a tiny question because I'm, I'm quite curious. Which is the age that prefer the online meeting and which is the age that hate the most the online meeting with the doctors? Because this is also for me a question of the 
generation, no? I cannot imagine my 82 years old uncle <laughs> going to an online meeting and I'm freaking out every time I go to the doctor because I say it's time lost in the commuting and I don't want to sit with everyone here in the waiting room for what I, I need to go, no? And do you have any 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 data about who is the uh, gener generation? I, I could send a letter. It's a bit of a of a misnomer or a mis uh, misunderstanding, as with many things with generations. Um, you know, it, it really depends. There are some that are incredibly savvy, and some that don't want anything to do with it. And it really depends on the relationship. It depends on the question at hand. It depends on the acuity level. It depends on sense of safety. It depends on if you have a right. You know, it depends on so many factors. Um, as to whether or not it's preferred or not. I, I, I will say that there is um, uh, more evidence that folks that are younger do prefer the, the, in, the virtual visit because of the timing, right? And they're less concerned about having that in person because they're so used to interacting like this. Um, and we have different apps and different ways, especially the, the diabetic pediatric community has been really the first um, to do that. They've been um, very much at, at the forefront of understanding what that looks like. You know, as we uh, Thank you. work this over to the corporate environment, uh, I've got to think culture is going to play a, a big part of things. Uh, you know, the, the now Gone is a very large uh, uh, international uh, machine-like company, and they, their culture is everybody, you know, you know, get in here, be a part of the interaction. And so is there, you know, is going to be that, it's going to be the shame for that person who is in their hybrid state where they're joining the meeting on the on the Zoom screen. So what's acceptable to the cultural uh, fingerprint is something I'm preoccupied with. Mm -hmm. This plays with our uh, website topic today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's an interesting question. I was talking with a major academic medical center, one you would all know, that was super concerned about how to because they have, they're, they're so famous that they'll have, you know, nine doctors meeting with one patient. And normally that works out just fine if you're in person. But, you know, they're imagine this massive conference room with all these little heads talking to this one patient, just how odd this sort of us versus you kind of dynamic is, especially when they're all together and the patient's not. And, and I think that that problem persists in all environments. You know, I, I love the sort of original, if one person is remote, everyone is remote. As a remote worker, I would love it if we could do that everywhere. Um, I don't know if that will be the case. I'm curious what others have to say about that. Yeah, it, it, definitely, definitely big, big part of that cultural fingerprint without a doubt. Uh, Michael Farrell, I, I know you're, uh, uh, you, you may be multitasking right now, but you're at a culture that gives carte blanche to people to do uh, a lot of creative things and making some changes there. I think, I think that's pretty, you know, that's got to be pretty refreshing. You know, here you are basically in charge of real estate in FM and uh, are you, and you're hanging out at your, your home on the other side of the hill. You're not in the Silicon Valley today. Today, that's right, yeah. Uh, you're right, David, I think it is refreshing. It's very cool to work at a place where we're so open-minded. That said, uh, for a guy like me, it makes figuring out how to do my job uh, incredibly challenging. I'm uh, looking at new office space in India and in the UK, and I don't really know where to start. How do I figure out who's coming back and um, uh, how much space we need? Um, but related to the conversation we're having today, it really has been such a great experience to start to think about the whole employee and how we support them no matter where they, that you've heard me say it, I think a lot of people on the call have heard me say it, I, I constantly say now I manage workplace and workplace is wherever you are. Uh, and that's been a really cool, interesting, challenging uh, opportunity to, to think differently about how we support employees. I think Rex talked about this a little earlier uh, or someone did related to uh, facilities people who, um, are providing different kinds of services now because they're thinking about the whole employee and how they can help them, how they can support them. Very true. Workplace is wherever you are. Nail right on the head there. You know what that. We have a lot of clients who are trying to address, as you've all heard, the equity in creating equitable experience for people who are remote. 
and also where they're trying to extend the workplace experience beyond the actual office space. Uh, and those are two things that are efforts to maintain the culture, which is key for everybody. You just walked into my wheelhouse of curiosity. How do you deal with uh, the person in Sao Paulo that's got uh, seven people and 500 square feet and they're really engaged with their team and they're, they, they're dying to get back and they will, but you know, for now they'll continue to be in this unequitable situation. I wonder what, you know, what, what steps a company can take for someone like that. That's difficult, right? Yeah, without a doubt. I think grace, grace and empathy. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd be curious for those, but I, I'm not sure what else one can do. I mean, I remember years ago when I was first uh, starting to work remotely and my, at the time, five-year-old son would just climb into my lap sometimes. And, uh, you know, would that be okay? And of course, now I think it would be, but um, I, I'm not sure that it would have been as okay at, at the time, right? And so uh, being okay with that, because to your point, I'm not so sure that they can really change their setting. And so instead, it's our reaction to it. 